Welcome everybody, uh, good evening and uh, just very quickly while David is getting organised on his side, my name is Greg Bonda, I'm with the Family Voice Australia, uh, New South Wales ACT State Director, David of course is our South Australian Northern Territory State Director and we will be your host tonight and um, of course our guest speaker tonight will be the Reverend Honourable Fred Nile member of the Legislative Council in the New South Wales Parliament. Uh, with, with Fred will be Sylvana Nile, uh, who is Deputy President of the Christian Democratic Party, and of course, a long time member of the, uh, of the party, as she's been a candidate in, the, in many elections. I'll introduce both of you formally. So what I'd like to do now is, very quickly, if I may, David, if you could, open up, say a few words, and then we'll have an opening prayer as well. Welcome everybody, by the way. We have a, a huge attendance um, tonight from all over Australia, including including um, uh, some very notable uh, clergy, uh, in particular from overseas as well. So thank you very much for all those that have registered. And of course, please feel free to email your questions and then David and I will uh, ask those questions at the end of the presentation. David Galena, could you please say a few words, introduction and your opening prayer. Thank you, David. Well, thank you so much, Greg. And it's a pleasure to be in connection with my dear friends, Fred and Silvana. And uh, it's been a while since I've seen you, Fred, and the, the yeah. lockdown doesn't help. But uh, Fred, I want to pay tribute to you firstly for your incredible service to our nation uh, and to the state of New South Wales in particular. Uh, I think you're the father of the house there in New South Wales, which means that you're the longest, longest serving MP. And it's just wonderful that you've been able to maintain this tremendous ministry to the, the state and the nation. So I do pay tribute. I just want to say a couple of words to sketch the theological background of this whole matter, really. Of course, um, what Fred has been on about for so many years is not so much the need for Christians in politics, but for Christian politics. So there's a distinction. There are many fine Christian people in our parliaments, but sometimes you wouldn't know that they are Christian or certainly not from some of their policies. Mm. So what we need is not so much Christians in politics, but Christian politics. Now, this doesn't mean that we should be imposing the Christian faith upon anyone, far from it. But what it means is that we do our politics in the name of Christ explicitly. And I think it's really uh, idolatry or even blasphemy to somehow leave Christ out of the picture, to cover up the face of Christ, because every earthly throne, power, ruler and authority, in fact, is claimed by him. So it's... Uh, really quite mischievous, I think, or misleading might be more charitable to say that Christians in Parliament should sort of keep their faith to themselves. Yes, quietly allow the wisdom of Christ to influence their judgment, but not to mention his name. I think that's most unsatisfactory. And I want to pay tribute to you, Fred, because I think it was you who taught me that lesson so many years ago when first we met at a meeting, when you said that what we need is not so much Christians in politics, but <coughs> Christian politics. And by that, I think you mean that we should honour Christ explicitly and not only draw upon his wisdom. The wisdom of God, of course, is vouchsafed to all of mankind. And every nation out there, I think, has got some wisdom that they can contribute. So we're not being closed-minded to pagans. Uh, we're recognising that the grace of God is a common grace and wisdom cries aloud to all mankind. But in Christ, we see all the wisdom and treasure of knowledge. In Christ are hidden all the, wisdom, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge we read in Colossians. So uh, it's wonderful that with our Christian heritage and forming your work, Fred, especially, and of course, Family Voice Australia, that we can not only avail ourselves of the riches of Christ, but we can do our politics, we can do our proclamation uh, as a Christian voice, explicitly naming him and honouring Christ as Lord. So with those opening remarks, perhaps I'll open in prayer, Greg, would that be appropriate? Thank you very much, David. 
Lord, we thank you for our dear brother Fred and for Silvana joining with, with him in these latter years to support him in this great odyssey that he's undertaken. And we just pray that your continued strength would be upon him as he serves and that others will heed the wisdom that he's been able to share over many decades and that you will indeed recruit an entire army of believers who will take this land by the grace of God, not by imposition, but by the wisdom of Christ and his love and his his uh, great blessing. So be with us tonight as we explore some of these themes. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you very much, David. Very well said and uh, indeed a very appropriate opening prayer. Welcome to Reverend Noel and Silvana. I will introduce Fred, then I'll introduce you, Silvana. Uh, the format for tonight for everybody is basically that uh, Reverend Noel will talk to you for about 10, 12 minutes, followed by Silvana. We would like to get into a Q&A session. David and I will field those questions and uh, hopefully we'll get through all of them. But in particular, I just really want to thank everybody for coming on board um, tonight. Uh, this is one of our highest rating webinars and we've had some very good people in the past. We've had the Honourable Mark, uh, Mark uh, Blason. We've had uh, Canberra Senators, Amanda Stoker, Senator Eric and Bett. Um, so we are really pleased that you've been able to join Reverend Fred Noll and Sylvana Noll. Let me introduce Fred very quickly. Reverend Noll, as you know, you and I have worked closely together for many years. Uh, you are the founder of the Christian Democratic Party, and of course, you're the longest serving member of New South Wales Parliament. And I'm sure there's a story there somewhere, Fred, uh, when you first joined with uh, Neville Rand, but you can get to that later. Mm -hmm. I know also that, uh, uh, Reverend, that uh, your aim has never been to disrupt the elected government, uh, but rather to amend bills where appropriate, uh, oppose bad and immoral legislation, and of course ensure that legislation is based on Christian principles. So thank you very much, Reverend, for coming on board. Uh, Sylvana, of course, you are so well known in the Democratic, uh, Christian Democratic Party, and of course publicly, you're um, highly regarded, you're the Deputy President, I believe, and of course you've been a candidate at numerous um, numerous uh, state and federal elections, and I have to say that I've even been your campaign manager at one time, which was very hectic, Sylvana, I must say, but of course uh, you did extremely well in those conditions. Reverend, may I hand over to you and give us the give us the picture of a Christian serving in Parliament, the Great Commissioner, uh, as it were. Thank you, Fred. Well, thank you, Greg, for inviting me and Savannah to share tonight. I appreciate that very much. And the publicity says that we're to share on the Great Commission, serving Christ in Parliament. And just to remind the viewers that the Great Commission is in Matthew chapter 28. Uh, where Jesus Christ said to his disciples, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So that's been my uh, purpose in Parliament to share that great commission uh, with all the members of parliament and with the public and with the community as I get the opportunity uh, through TV and radio and so on. And the scripture that influenced me to get involved in parliament, fully involved in parliament, was where God spoke to me through Romans chapter 13, uh, verse 1, that every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. Now, I understand the word power in the New Testament period to be referring to the government. And the government could be the governor, could be the emperor, the king, a ruler. And in later years, of course, we had elected parliaments. Whoever, therefore, reading the following verses, resists the power, resists the government, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist should receive unto themselves damnation. For rulers, and I would say governments, and in my case, the state government, are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will you then not be afraid of the power, but do that which is good, 
and you shall have praise of the same. Now, the verse that is the key verse for me being involved in Parliament is this verse 4. For he, the government, is the minister of God. Now, I'm not translating this. I'm reading it as it states. For he, the government, is the minister of God, to thee for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid. For he, the government, bears not the sword in vain, and it repeats it again. For he, the government, is a minister of God, a, re a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. Now that scripture had a big impact on me uh, and the way that the, the uh, uh, Apostle Paul wrote it with the emphasis uh, in those verses, repeating the, the theme in that one verse four, for he's the minister of God, he's the minister of God. Now I'm a, I'm a minister of God already. And uh, it just means I'm in the right place uh, to serve God. And I still remember when I came into Parliament the very first time, one of the attendants stopped me at the front of the uh, chamber and said, uh, Reverend Niall, you know this is a church, don't you? And I thought he was having a joke with me. And so I said, yes, I didn't know. But I, I, I got later down to find the history of the Parliament, the chamber where I sit, have sat for over 30 odd years in, in my own special seat, that it was a church. Now, you may think it's a bit uh, presumptuous for me to say this, but I believe God prepared that church for me. So not only did he give me a seat in the parliament, he gave me a, a place of God's place, the chamber, a church, for me to be his servant, uh, to be his minister of God in the parliament. So uh, I really feel at home in the parliament, and, and I know it was mentioned already that we are in a parliament, obviously, with other people who are not Christians, but that is a challenge for me, to be, in all the ways I speak, Christ-like, to be like Jesus, that they would actually see Fred Noel, not Fred Noel, look through me and say, this man is really like Jesus. He, he loves us. He even loves the people who are uh, shouting at him and interrupting him and trying to stop him speaking and so on. He doesn't revile him. He doesn't react. And, and I just thank the Lord for that. And I pray that he always give me that uh, spirit that I can be like Jesus, Christ-like in the parliament, and by my words and so on, be a witness for Jesus Christ. And to do what Jesus uh, said in the Great Commission, that we are to teach them to do all things that I have told you. I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. Now, he was obviously saying, teach them, referring to the disciples. But I believe I have... Uh, in, in the parliament, in the upper house, the chamber, I have a congregation, and you made a, a brief reference to Neville Rand. When I was first elected, he nearly had a heart attack. And he said, well, one, he actually gave a big speech on my election attacking me. I spent a whole lot of time. And he kept saying, the one thing, he said, I know for a fact, this Fred Nile, he won't last. Well, I'm still there for 39 years, and he's gone into, this, into the distance. Uh, almost uh, forgotten. So uh, I just thank the Lord that he gave me the opportunity to serve him uh, in the parliament. And I'm pleased to be here uh, with Savannah, my second wife. And I just thank God that he also allowed my first wife, Elaine, to be elected uh, to the parliament mm -hmm. and to be there in parliament with me, uh, in her case, for over 11 years, uh, four months. And she was a, a very uh, spiritual woman. And uh, I had a rule when I was first elected that the parliament is so important, we should be there all the time. Uh, when you go into parliament, if you visit parliament, you'll be surprised, it's almost empty. The politicians, there's a minimum of eight members to make it work, uh, to have a quorum. But what happens is as soon as they ask a question or make a speech, they go back to their office or maybe they go back to the billiard room, back to the cafeteria, the dining room. I don't know where they go, but they all leave the chamber. But I stay there. And I said to Elaine, I'm sorry that now you've been elected. That's my little rule. You and I have to stay there. So what did Elaine do? She sat there for a little while thinking, then she would get up and evangelize the chamber. She would go around the chamber sitting 
mostly with the toughest labour women there, hard-bitten labour women, because they'd be there as part of the quorum. She'd go and sit next to them and witness to them and change them. And so when she had, uh, later after those 11 years, four months, and had to retire because of cancer and, and finally died, she had so much witness to them, they were all at her funeral. There was over 800 people at her funeral packing the church uh, to the doors. And I believe they came out of respect for her, what she had been like as a loving Christian, as I endeavoured to be. Maybe she was more successful uh, than me. But I thank God for the years that I prepared for Parliament. I didn't know about Parliament because I was brought up in an evangelical church where we were told not to get involved in politics, not to get involved with Parliament. So I had that kind of mental uh, block until I read those scriptures and saw, yes, uh, I can be involved in, in politics. I can be involved in government. And as far as evangelism goes, it's strange how God led my life because I believe in the Great Commission. I follow it with all my heart and soul. And God has kept opening up the doors to be uh, a leader of evangelism without me having a big label on my coat. Uh, it's just the way I believe God actually did it. God opened the doors. So I was a leader of the Christian Endeavour Movement for a number of years with 50,000 members, mostly young people. And then later, to my surprise, the phone rang and it was an Anglican bishop. And he said, Billy Graham's coming to Sydney and we need a crusade director and they can't provide one uh, because they have so many crusades on at the same time. So uh, the church leaders have met and we believe you're the man to organise Billy Graham's crusade. I nearly fell off my chair because Billy Graham was my hero and uh, I'd do anything for Billy Graham. So it was a great privilege for me to actually to organise as an amateur, even though I had organised lots of church crusades and other crusades, to be a director of the Billy Graham crusade in 1968. So that was uh, putting into action uh, the Great Commission. After I'd completed that role, uh, to my surprise, I was then invited by the, direct, by the Methodist Church to become director of evangelism for the Methodist Church in New South Wales. And so I was so pleased to be in that role, director of outreach and evangelism in the Wesley Mission in the heart of the city. And I didn't know that that job would lead me into another area of evangelism uh, because uh, Bill, um, Alan Walker, who was in charge, interviewed me and he said, I'm giving you five jobs. Uh, you'll be director of outreach and evangelism and so on. But one of the five jobs is running uh, the Methodist Training College. And now I had never run a college before. And he said, uh, you'll be the principal of that college. And I said, great, I'm happy to do that. It was one of my five jobs. But it wasn't very long before God showed me uh, it was to be a college of evangelism, a college to train evangelists. And so I advertised and I had about 25 young uh, people join the college, uh, both young men and young women. And, um, and I, I was so grateful. I did all this right in the middle of the Jesus revolution or the Jesus movement. And these young people were so enthusiastic. So I then had them become trained for evangelism in that, uh, in that college, more than perhaps they'd ever would have experienced under previous uh, principles. So I thank the Lord that he kept leading me into this field of evangelism and finally, of course, uh, led me into the Parliament in 1981 when I was elected to the Parliament and I've continued to be re-elected year after year and I thank God for that. So I started a, a Bible study group for the members of Parliament and so we used to meet on Thursday mornings for prayer. We never had great numbers. We got to 16 on one occasion but it was often five and six, <clears throat> but it was a great privilege to uh, minister the word of God in that small group uh, situation uh, in the upper house. So when I mentioned about those students training them to be evangelists, I said, one thing you need to do, if you're going to be street evangelism, evangelist, you have to relate to the people on the street. You can't go out with a suit and tie and look very strict and um, like you're a very religious person. You have to relate to the people. So I said to these young people who were wearing casual clothes, one was wearing an old army overcoat, 
I said, don't take them off. Keep those clothes on when you go out to the street witnessing for Christ so you can identify with other young people on the street. And then one day I had a phone call from the uh, head of the cafeteria at the Methodist uh, Church, Central Methodist Mission, saying, we've got some young people here uh, who are very untidy, wearing those street clothes. In fact, one or two of them don't even have shoes on. They have bare, they're barefooted. And they're claiming to be your students <laughs> in, our, in our college. I, I said, what's their names? And they weren't my students. They were following my instructions to the letter. And they were exactly like they were when they came to the college off the street. And uh, they went on to serve God and still continue to serve God. And, uh, of course, we had open-air meetings on the street uh, outside um, Woolworths, opposite the Sydney Town Hall. So we practiced evangelism uh, with all the students, every opportunity we had. So I thank God for the opportunities God has given to me to witness for him. Uh, I won't go into all the bills and that, that I've put up and bills that I've had passed. Uh, it's almost impossible to get a bill passed when you're... Uh, uh, an independent or in a small party. But I thank God that I did get the Tobacco Advertising Prohibition Act passed, which prohibit, prohibited in New South Wales all the advertising of tobacco products, cigarettes. And I went for break after that. I, think, I thought I'll put another bill up to ban smoking too. And uh, that bill was passed as well, to ban smoking in public places. So I give God the glory for that. I praise the Lord. And um, I'll endeavour to serve the Lord and to promote the gospel of Christ every opportunity I get. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. That's a pretty good um, overview of your role. And uh, we'll come back to some of the some of the more uh, more um, sort of strategic questions that will be asked. So thank you very much, Fred. May I now introduce Savannah, of course. Um, you, you, Savannah, of course. Uh, very uh, intricately involved in the Christian Democratic Party. You are the Deputy President. You've been a candidate. Tell us about your role of a Christian witnessing in the public arena. How have you managed all that um, uh, in, in the past few years? Yes. Um, well, first of all, I've got a big act to follow. As, as you can see, uh, Reverend Honourable Fred Nile, um, has done amazing work and to think that the Lord brought me in as a, a single mum with three kids uh, and uh, Fred fell in love with me. I had a calling to come in. I uh, never wanted to be in politics. So my story and my sharing tonight with everyone will be more about encouraging you on the Great Commission because we all have a calling to be uh, on that road as the disciples were and as Paul was as well and uh, the Roman roads that were built and that God has paved a way for all of us. We have all been born for a time such as this. We have to hear the calling of God. So how have I served in all of this? Well, uh, I came into politics, as I said, it was something I never, ever wanted to, to do. But God will call us into the arenas that we may not necessarily want to be in or to do. I was happy to be a missionary in Africa or New Guinea. And so I believe I was quite happy to be around in native clothes, feeding people, holding babies, and just doing whatever I had to do. I, I didn't want to live in the highlight of having photography, uh, having to have uh, a say on everything, having to speak up and being bold and courageous. I wanted to be humble in the background. But God sometimes takes the ones that want to be humble in the background and he puts us right in the limelight and, yeah. and, and we have to stand for him. So everything I'm doing is out of obedience to the Lord. I just never knew that it was going to be the Reverend Honourable Fred Nah that was going to fall in love with me. And with time, God opened my heart to fall in love with him. And so as my husband said, we would be able to do twice the work and uh, rather than what we could do both individually, that we would be, uh, be enabled by the grace of God to be able to do mighty works in his name. And again, give the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. So as the disciples were commissioned to go out 
and uh, to, to bring the good news uh, to the world and to baptize uh, those that they brought the good news to. Uh, so it is with us today. Uh, that commission is continuing and we have our paths and our roads as well. And we have to know where that calling is. So if you still are unsure about where that is, just take the bold step. And sometimes you might feel from the Lord, you don't know where you're going, what you're doing or what's happening. But he says, take the first step, open your mouth <laughs> and I will give you the words to say and I will show you the road to take. And that's exactly where I was when I came into politics. I remember saying to Trish Ellis, who was the publicity officer of CDP at that time, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I have to do or what to say, but I know God's called me into politics. And she said, you are the prime candidate because God is not looking for the ones that know it all. He's not looking for the skilled in their own eyes. He's not looking for the ones that have got the answers for everything. He's looking for the humble and the, the obedient and the available. So as long as you are available, obedient, and you humble yourself before the Lord, he will show you your path. So as I said, my role then coming into government has been a a political missionary because I couldn't go out and be an African or New Guinean missionary. I believe I have come in as a political missionary, an ambassador for the Lord, which we all are when we're positioned for God. I don't have an exclusive right, but that's what I, I do. I'm an ambassador for Christ and I'm an intercessory prayer. So this is how I serve my husband best. I'm number one, his wife. Uh, first of all, I serve God, then I serve my family, and then I work in my job. So I always do. So if God says, drop everything and pray, I drop everything and pray, and I do intercessory praying for my husband, for the party. I also fast. I, I will fast up to three days, and sometimes that has been not just without food, that has also been without water. And that is to, I do Esther fast their Esther fasts and what we do is we get breakthrough when we pray and we fast we get breakthrough so uh, how do I serve uh, I serve in government uh, serving God first uh, through intercessory prayer number two my husband and my family and then I do my job so if Reverend Noel needs anything to be done then I do everything he needs. So uh, I will work between the head office, the parliamentary office, uh, if there's any work that needs um, guidance or direction or I need to counsel or I need to help in that way, I also help that way. Uh, I'm the deputy, so I'm, I'm in, the, um, in two committees. I'm in uh, the CDP board and um, also in the... Um, uh, the, the, the main meeting uh, of, of, of the board, uh, major board members. So uh, that's my, my role. Um, so I also then, um, uh, I, I do every, all the running around wherever it's needed. Uh, we have um, a, a Shabbat Shalom service on uh, Friday nights that we organise as well. So since the COVID-19, we've actually, uh, Reverend Nile and I hold communion on a Friday night at, at home. And, uh, but we've just started going back to church now. Church just opened up two weeks ago. So we started going back. Um, and uh, so we're helping there. Now I help also with media releases. Uh, if Reverend Nile needs, if I see anything in the media, I will contact uh, Fred's chief of staff uh, and prompt him for those media releases. And also I stay engaged with our um, Craig Hall at the head office and uh, anybody else uh, that needs need, needs um, any kind of uh, assistance, but also uh, they assist me. So it's a team effort. We work as a solid team. So when we go out and we preach the word of God, so as I see it in politics as being the platform that God has given me, my great commission is therefore whenever I stand and I've stood since 2007, I stood as an independent. I came into CDP in 2012 and I have stood in local, state and federal. 
During that time, that is my great commission. So when I am preparing and I go out throughout New South Wales, locally throughout New South Wales, I am an ambassador for Christ. So my opportunities that God gives me to witness and to speak the gospel and to also uh, proclaim his word and his kingdom come purposes, but it's also to, to also advertise our party uh, because we are the only party the only Christian, true Christian party that bases everything, all our policies on biblical principles. So we hold what's called a Christian worldview. So everything we do, we do from our Judeo-Christian heritage. And let me repeat that, our Judeo-Christian heritage. So we uphold Israel. And one of our main uh, policies is that we uphold Israel as the undivided capital of Israel. And we do the, uh, sorry, the undivided capital. Jerusalem is the undivided capital of Israel. And we uphold that because we believe uh, that the Messiah will be coming back to Israel. And Israel is not his forgotten people. And uh, that we are to uphold and love Israel at this time and make sure that we support her in every way that we can. So we bring that with everything else we do. But then we also, uh, we also uphold the Coptic Christians, the Assyrians, mm -hmm. the Armenians. Um, we uphold uh, the Asian groups, the Taiwanese, the Chinese, uh, the Indians, Malaysians, Indonesians. Um, we uphold the Australians, of course, our nation. So we look at working with many, many groups and helping uh, the ones that are on the peripheral as well. So the persecuted church, the persecuted Christians in all over the world and giving priority to our brothers and sisters. But we also help the Muslims where we can as well. So we do not um, uh, discriminate if uh, Muslims come to us and they need help and support and love we also help where we can so we look at loving everybody across board and um, and loving everyone as much as we can so I and and what we do promote is um, in our policies is zero violence um, zero tolerance towards domestic violence zero tolerance towards pornography. We are pro-life, so it's um, no abortion. Um, and we also say no to euthanasia. And uh, we also uh, promote life wherever we can. But also we look at being custodians of our nation. So we look at protecting our environment, our flora and fauna. Uh, we look at doing a lot of things in these areas of the environment as well. So um, I'd like to also uh, just read something. There's, there's so many things I can give you, but I think some of the most important things I'd like to share with you this evening is particularly from we're probably asking ourselves during this COVID-19 crisis, why are we suffering so much? Why are we locked down? Because um, at this time, God is using this period to open our hearts up and to get closer to him. So we're not running to our sport. We're not running to our, our communities and just our families, that we're running to God exclusively. And so I'd like to read this to you from Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you fully obey all these commandments of the Lord, your God, the laws that I'm declaring to you today, God will transform you into the greatest nation in the world. These are the blessings that will come upon you. Blessings in the city, blessings in the field, many children, ample crops, large flocks and herds, blessings of fruit and bread. Blessings when you come in and blessings when you go out. So isn't it great to know that God wants to bless us? And you might be asking us, well, why aren't we getting blessed? Well, have we been following God's commandments, laws, and what he's asked us to do? Because God says also, but if you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and do not obey all the commands and decrees that I am giving you today, all these curses will come and overwhelm you. Your towns and your fields will be cursed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be cursed. Your children and your crops will be cursed. 
The offspring of your herds and flocks will be cursed. And wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be cursed. So let's not be a nation that's cursed. Let's be a sheep nation and uphold Israel and love other nations and love all people. And we will be blessed because for those that curse Israel will be cursed and those that bless Israel will be blessed. So let's bless one another, love one another and take this COVID-19 as an opportunity to ask God how you can serve him best on the Great Commission and where your path and road is in your church, in your ethnic organisation and Reverend Nile and I will be there to support you. And may I finish on this note and say to Greg Vonda, thank you so much, Greg, for the opportunity that you have given us and your wonderful support as our campaign, um, as our CDP manager during that time that you were there and supporting Reverend Nile and I in many campaigns. And we bless you and thank you and may you be blessed through this this evening as well. Thank you, everyone. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Silvana. This is very, uh, um, of course, very, uh, very emotional. I, I know that you speak with passion, and I'm so pleased that you mentioned that uh, God comes first in your in your ministry work and in your political work. Because I remember, Reverend, when I first wrote your speech uh, back in those days at the at the 2016 election, I remember writing a speech or whatever it was, and I headed it up. Uh, this speech is by the Honourable Reverend Fred Noel, MLC, and you corrected me, Fred, to say, no, that's incorrect, Greg. It is Reverend Honourable Fred Noel, MLC, because nobody comes before God. And I think that's always remained with me. So um, very, very, very good to know. Uh, we have some questions for you. We'd love for you to sort of, uh, you know, uh, whoever wants to answer them. But there are a lot of questions that come through. And uh, I'd like David, our, our co-host, to... David, if you could kick up with the first question that you've got from, the, from our um, yes. people. Thank you. C certainly, Greg. Uh, from Christopher. How do we get a critical mass of Christian politicians in government? It would seem that demand is high, but supply is low mainly because the path to being in a position as an office holder is too hard to navigate amongst the demands of family, work, community. So how do we get a critical mass of Christian politicians? Well, it gets back to what the church is doing and its spirit of evangelism and, and so on, that it's motivating and mobilising the people. They're not just... Uh, people off the street, they're politicians, members of parliament, who go to church. Do they ever get challenged by their pastor uh, to serve Christ in the parliament, to be faithful to Christ in parliament, not to compromise in parliament, as many of them do. So it's not easy, and it gets back to the Holy Spirit as well, uh, working in people's lives, and we need to have a lot of prayer for God to bless our nation, to bless our parliaments, and to raise up uh, more and more really committed members of parliament who love Jesus and who love the people and who uh, see themselves there in that role of evangelism. And our real problems um, today are not political or even, uh, they're not economic and not even political. Our real problems today are a lack of good character values and common decency. So if you're a person who has um, good values and common decency and Christian principles, uh, then you're a suitable candidate. And it's about restoring this back into public policy. And as Reverend mentioned in Romans 3.16, the government is the minister of God. We are not just here to serve in the church or in our local community. God does call us equally to government. Mm -hmm. And we have, if you've um, listened to any of Lance Warner's um, material, he talks about the seven mountains. And it's about time that the Christians started claiming the mountains of politics, mm -hmm. media, education, health, 
entertainment, all of those mountains are there. You have to see where you're to be raised in this time because we're moving into the harvest period. And God is saying the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. So any of those of you that are called or you're feeling a calling, pursue it. Do not fear. This is a time in your life that God wants us to be bold and courageous. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Silvana. That's interesting you mentioned that, Silvana, because um, I personally believe that there is a real role for Christians in the public arena. Reverend Noel, what do you see the future of Christian political parties? I mean, um, times are changing. We've got different splinter groups coming on board. There are other conservative or, uh, political parties. What's your personal view? And I know God works in mysterious ways, but What's your view for political parties for the future? Well, it is a challenge, uh, Greg, as you just said. Uh, when I was first elected, I was the first independent to be elected, the Christian independent. Mm. And a whole lot of people said after that, look, if someone even like Fred and I can get elected, I could get elected. And that really helped mobilise other mm. uh, candidates who weren't Christians, but also mobilise other parties. And I think that's a situation we're now facing. Uh, because of the growth and impact of the Christian Democratic Party, we now have a number of other parties that have started. Um, I don't think too many of them profess to be active Christian parties, uh, but sometimes there are Christians within those parties as well. And I think that confuses the public then as to, well, who do I vote for? Do I vote for Fred Niles' party, the Christian Democratic Party, or vote for one other sustainable Australia um, is that a Christian party? But sometimes people running it present it as a Christian party. So I think people have to really study before they vote what the parties stand for and what they do in Parliament. Uh, are they practising Christian politics in Parliament? And do they have the courage to speak? And also to be, I would say, hopefully, Bible-believing Christians who take the Bible seriously. I'd like to add to that and say, if you look at um, parties like Family First, Australian Conservatives, uh, Liberty Alliance uh, are three that just come to mind. Um, and I think years back, there was also the Australian Democrats. These parties came in with what they claim to be Christian principles. But in fact, you'll see that a lot of secularism ran through their parties and they may have started off stronger, but they watered down into secularism, where the Christian Democratic Party for 38 years has stood the test of time. Reverend Nile has, has put into practice what he has preached and he has not diverted from the original. So if you're looking for a party to support, really look at a God-ordained party. And Reverend Noel has an anointing on him. And until the good Lord tells him to be removed, he will not be doing that because God brought him in to start this party and he will not go until God tells him to. So we are still, in my mind, from studying all the parties before I came into politics, we are the authentic, uh, true, blue, Aussie biblical based party so if that's what you're looking for then that's what we'll be able to uh, to help you with amen thank you Silvana. elections not till two years away Silvana, but that sounded like a very good very good um, campaign speech so i'll look forward to two years time david your next question please yes a question from lynn who raises the matter of abortion in connection with us having a Christian Prime Minister. So is there hope that with a Christian Prime Minister there would be some dealing with abortion? I realise, of course, abortion is largely a state issue, but it's funded federally. So perhaps um, there might be something that the Prime Minister can do. Would you reflect on that, Fred? Yes, well, I'm very impressed with Scott Morrison as our Prime Minister. And uh, when he got elected, I said to a whole lot of people, uh, when they said, well, how did he get elected? Uh, he's a Christian. I said it was a miracle, a miracle of God. And I was very pleased when people asked Scott Morrison, how did he get elected? He said it was a miracle. He was giving God the glory. Now, that means we've got a chance on all these moral issues where we've moved away from God's values, God's standard, from the word of God, from the Bible, to try to reverse that 
trend, and I'm sure he'll be uh, in the forefront of that. But he needs encouragement, he needs support, and we need to have a strategy, exactly what we're doing. Uh, so it makes sense, uh, because he's a very intelligent man, to have him on side for whatever we're seeking to do in that pro-life area. Mm. Um, if we've looked at abortion, uh, you couldn't have had a, a stronger ad advocate and representative for that than uh, Reverend Honourable Fred Nile. We had a huge um, uh, stand and fight and struggle and it was so wonderful to see uh, Glenn Davies, uh, uh, the Archbishop of the uh, Anglican Church, uh, uh, Anthony Fisher, the Archbishop of the Catholic Church, and all the Orthodox from the Assyrian, Armenian, and uh, Greek Orthodox, of course, and the Coptic Christians, all coming together in Martin Place, uh, hailing the word of God. And this fight is still on. Mm. Don't give up. Um, and uh, Reverend Noel was able to bring many amendments in that helped, at least were able to support the babies that are aborted at 12 months that are still alive. Uh, we've been able to get care for those babies where in mm. all the other states they're left to die um, on the floor of those hospitals or wherever else they're taken away. So now legislation is starting mm. to change. So we don't lose anything in God. Anything we do in God is never in vain. Uh, you have to remember that God hears us and things do change. And we are now appealing those abortion laws as we are appealing same-sex um, uh, same-sex marriage as well. We've got petitions out for that. So we don't stop. Uh, God's word, uh, we've seen abortion change in states in America that were for abortion, that have um, mm. now have no abortion. We've seen uh, states also and countries change from having um, same-sex marriage to not having same-sex marriage. And look what's happening with Russia. There's laws now totally against that and the church and the state are working together. And in this country, we have to keep working. The state and the church may encourage all the ministers out there tonight, please do not give up. Continue to write letters to your politicians and do not give up the good fight. It is a good fight and we continue until God calls us home. Thank you, Silvana. Uh, Reverend, interestingly, I've just got an email from somebody that mentions that your first political campaign was at St. Matthew's Manly, and the rector there was uh, David Cohen. So people are still remembering your very first campaign, Chris. So it's good to see that that your your um, your, your name and your um, activities are living on. David? Yes, uh, another question from Alton asking, do you feel there are prospects for other Christians to follow your example? Definitely. And that's one of the problems mm -hmm. where the church has been negative about getting involved in politics, not studying the word of God, as I was quoting from the Bible earlier. There are many uh, instructions in the scriptures to be involved in godly government. And that's my cry where... Uh, Christians don't seem to see the need or respond to the call. They should be studying it, then responding to the call and being involved. Now, sometimes political parties uh, are not too happy with enthusiastic Christians. And I know some of my friends who want to be in the Liberal Party or other parties find it's very hard to get pre-selection. There's like a little labour goes on, you know, this is, you know, he's a Christian, whisper, whisper. And uh, that candidate gets rejected. I'm saying to the political parties, you need more Christians in your party and more Christians in Parliament. Yes. Don't reject them. They'll save your party for the future. Yeah. And a question from Rob saying, uh, Reverend Nile, you're a godly man. Thank you for your witness. When you see an overt anti-God proposal in the parliament, what are the steps that you take to confront the work of Satan? Very good question. <laughs> right, well, we've worked out a lot of strategies and yes. some of them are fairly obvious. Uh, we normally, like we're having a big issue right now, uh, the uh, Turkish uh, Prime Minister has announced he wants to turn the big, the biggest uh, Christian uh, cathedral Saints. into a mosque. Mm. 
And, and to me, that's a red hot issue for Christians. And Christians should take up that issue now in their churches. Petitions are being distributed and uh, get behind it. And if we can, it's going to take God's help to do it, to change that Turkish Prime Minister to not only uh, stop turning into a mosque, but to restore it as a true Christian church and hand it back to the Orthodox churches to provide the clergy and uh, all the, the messages and the music in that cathedral. We don't look at what comes against us as an attack. We look at it as an opportunity. People ask, why doesn't God solve all the problems in my family? Well, God lets the problems happen so that issues can be solved. And it's the same in Parliament. It's a blessing, not a curse. If we can look at the opportunity with St Sophia, um, we have an opportunity to take it back to its original uh, um, state. And at the mm -hmm. moment, we're only a few signatures away from our federal government saying we want it to be um, turned back to its original state of being a Christian church. So we as nations can stand up uh, as a whole mm -hmm. and be able to have the power to be able to not just change decisions mm -hmm. locally, or in the state or federally, but also internationally. And I remember saying to Reverend Nile when these things happened, oh, we were just doing so well. And now this has come in and he'd say, well, he said, we just go back to the drawing board and we pray to God and we ask him for the next strategy. So don't forget, as Christians, mm -hmm. you can go into the war room and pray in intercessory prayer and ask God for strategy. We are never short of a strategy from God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Savannah. Fred, you, you will recall that uh, I know I've known you personally for a long time. Your history shows, shows that you've been persecuted. Uh, I remember the, the gay Mardi Gras marches, the, the various um, attacks on your person, on, your, on, on you as a person. Um, Fred, if you look at China, religious freedom there is under attack as well. Um, can you say a few words quickly about what's happening in China for me? Yes. Well, that's a very important issue. I'm not sure whether you know, but I was just involved uh, with the Chinese community in Sydney today. Uh, on a Zoom uh, uh, seminar with, a, with about eight speakers uh, about what's happening in China mm -hmm. with the persecution of the uh, Chinese mm -hmm. citizens who follow um, what's it called the... Uh, well, there was the Xin in uh, mm -hmm. combination. No, uh, following the cult, what's it called? There's a cult anyway, no. but we'll come up no, with it. has got the name. Yeah. Um, Not uh, Falun Gong. Yes, yeah, thank gone. you. Oh, my God, yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry. Right. I've just been talking about it all the mm. afternoon. <laughs> well and gone. Uh, and the Chinese government has uh, strongly reacted to that, even though they're very progressive in economic issues and inventions and the military. But on that issue, they've taken a hard line and um, doing all they can uh, to arrest the Chinese who are following it to persecute them, uh, even to putting them in prison and uh, giving them long sentences and making life very difficult for them to try to crush that movement, um, which is not a real religious movement, but it has a spiritual uh, basis to it. And, um, and it, it fits in with the Chinese culture as well. So mm. I, I'm, I know why the Chinese Communist Party sees it as competition and I'll do all they can to stop it. But I, I believe we need to give it our support, as I did this afternoon uh, in the forum with other leading speakers like Professor David Flint and uh, Senator Erica Betts and so on. They're all on the panel speaking on the Zoom TV. So there is a movement building up to um, maintain uh, that freedom of religion and freedom yes. of... Speech. Speech in China. Yes. And I have, they succeeded. And God gave me a little strategy as I, as I was speaking this afternoon. And I said in my contribution, we should lobby the president and his wife of China. Yes. Uh, they claim to be progressive. Uh, and his wife, I understand, is quite a moderate. Uh, then they should show the fruit, that fruit, 
in uh, protecting those who follow Falun Gong in China and just regard that as another uh, community organisation and allow them to freely uh, practice, which is basically a lot of exercises. It's very healthy and it's very good for older uh, Chinese to be engaged in it. Thank you. David. Yes, a question from Adam. Uh, what steps do you take to tell the truth on matters such as the Whitlam dismissal to both sides of politics? To both sides of politics. Mm -hmm. Both long. sides. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very pleased that the truth has come out, uh, that the, the Queen was not the ringmaker <laughs> in controlling <laughs> that and deciding to get rid of the Labor government in Australia. <laughs> Uh, it was simply the wish uh, of the Governor General and for his own reasons, even though he probably it was more pro-Labor than pro-Liberal. Mm, uh, but he felt uh, in this case he had a, a, an obligation as Governor General uh, to remove a Prime Minister who was breaking all the rules and uh, was threatening really the future of Australia. And so he took that action. But it has been proved now with the correspondence from the palace, uh, the Queen was not aware of what was going to happen and did not have any role in saying, yes, you must do it. She was a bit surprised when she heard the final announcement that the uh, Labor government had been dismissed. Yes. She was as surprised as anyone. And it is one, Adam, in the court for the monarchists in this country, because a lot of the Republicans uh, were using it to say, let's bring down the Queen, you know, she supported in the Whitlam sacking. So great move for the monarchists and uh, let's keep this country uh, with Queen Elizabeth as our Queen uh, because she is um, under oath with the Lord for the protection of the nations in that Commonwealth mm. and we do receive blessing and protection under that. So what a blessing for the Queen and the monarchists. It's a win for righteousness and a win for justice. Amen. And a win for the kingdom Amen. of God. Thank you very much. I wonder if we could, um, we're getting close to eight o'clock. Um, can I personally say, Reverend, that you look very well. Um, you've served God in the public arena, in parliament. Savannah, you've been a great support to the Reverend. I know that personally but obviously you're very passionate with uh, your, your faith. Uh, I just wish you well as we go into the next election. Again, it's church and state. I don't think there's a separation between the two, but I do commend you, Reverend, on the work that you've done. And uh, I wonder if David could close in prayer for us and then we'll um, end the discussion. I just want to also mention to everybody that this has been recorded People will be able to review it, look at it again. Uh, again, Reverend, I think you look fantastic. Savannah, of course, you look fantastic as well. And I wish you well as you go next two years before the next uh, New South Wales Upper House election. David, could you close in prayer for us, please? Absolutely. Uh, Father, we thank you for the refreshing time we've had in discussion with Fred and Silvana and Greg. And we thank you for all of the participants, those who've sent in their questions. We haven't been able to get to all of them, but uh, you know those questions, Lord, and you're able to answer them. So help us to seek you in prayer about these issues. And Lord, I just pray again for strength for Fred and Silvana as they continue in this great work. And I pray that all of us participating and others uh, will be refreshed and just so motivated to step up in what we're doing. Uh, we can win this battle, Lord, and so help us, we pray. And we just ask that we would reverence Christ in this whole process. Uh, Fred has uh, indicated that he wants people to see your son in his life. And I pray that for all of us, that we would shine the love of Jesus and people would see in our eyes his great love. And so help us all, we pray. But we also recognise that all of us are called to reverence every parliamentarian, every civic authority, even those with whom we might vigorously disagree. And we ask that we would, for Christ's sake, submit ourselves to them, not necessarily going along with everything they ask us to do, 
but submission as stakeholders and participants, mm -hmm. those who are prepared to roll up their sleeves. So for the sake of your son, we do pray that we would rightly understand what it means to submit ourselves and that we would do our part as good citizens. And so, again, we thank you for this opportunity and we ask that your blessing will be upon all of our participants and indeed that they would become instrumental to recruit a, a tremendous army of people who will be engaged in the public arena for the sake of Christ. This we ask in his name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. All thank the you everyone who's, Greg. who's yeah. great participating in yes, organising this uh, Amen. event. Thank you. And well. Greg, a Reverend Al did, uh, and I picked a declaration because they're, they're saying that 2020 is the year of declaration. So whatever we declare the Lord from uh, uh, the Bible, uh, blessings will outpour for us. So we've picked up uh, this declaration for everyone this evening and it's called Binding Up Weariness. So today, Reverend Nile and I, in the name of Jesus Christ, break the power of all weariness in Jesus' name. We say that every evil entity from the enemy is rendered powerless to steal your resolve and rob you of your determination. We call upon the heavenly hosts to be released and wage war on your behalf. We pray the Lord supplies you with supernatural strength so that you can stand your ground. You will mount up with eagle's wings, run and not grow weary. You will walk and not faint. And we say you are completely overshadowed with faith and power. You shall not become tired in well-doing. You will stay the course and finish all that heaven has given you to do without giving up or giving into pressure. We de declare your harvest shall not be stolen from you and go forth in your great commission in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you, Savannah. Thank you, David. Our next webinar, please make sure next week we've got Nick Farr Jones. And on a Wednesday of next week, we've got the Anglican Archbishop, Glenn Davis. So look forward to those notices. God bless everybody and good night. God be with you. Yeah.